putting the uniform on as a paramedic, it's almost like having a second version of myself. You have a chance to get out there in the community and save people. Emergency services. Hurry, stop breathing. He's unconscious. OK, an ambulance is being sent. Every second counts, and every second that we don't get, there is another second that that patient gets closer to death. Oh. Open your eyes. Oh. So, fallen from five metres. Where's Mum? They're in their darkest hour, and they just hand you all their trust and say, here, you help us. We're here now. Our priority is just to make sure that you're OK. The minute you walk in, it's like, thank God the paramedics are here. It's OK. What do you think that looks like? <laughs> oh. Really enjoy going to someone and turning that frown upside down. Give me a big smile. <laughs> One still. We've got gotcha. you. Delivering a patient to hospital in a better state than what they were in is phenomenal. He'll be all right. I can't thank them enough. No problems. Honestly, they're like angels. Mum, I love you. I go home knowing that I've made a difference. That's it. Ah. Stop CPR. He's got a pulse. Being a paramedic has taught me life is precious and you shouldn't take a second for granted. On this episode of Paramedics... Oh, my goodness. A truck has fallen down on top of my body. Rescue teams work frantically to free a man trapped under a two-ton tractor. I know it's hurting, mate. The injuries from this kind of accident can be absolutely catastrophic. Taz and Erica need to urgently figure out why a much-loved grandma has collapsed. I know these things are quite scary. Yeah. When your blood pressure and heart rate is low, that means the body is not getting enough blood supply to your vital organs. This is a serious condition. And Simon and Michaela pull into an ambulance branch. So roles allocated? Yeah. To perform a high-risk procedure to save the life of a mum of two. It's crucial that everybody knows the plan because we all have someone's life in our hands. Erica, are you excited you're working with a legend? <laughs> it's the start of shift for paramedic of 13 years, Taz, and his new partner, Erica. Who would have thought five years down the track? Oh, Taz, I never could have imagined in my wildest dreams that I'd be working with a superstar. <laughs> Erica was embraced by the Taz charm on their first meeting. The first time I met Taz, I was in my first couple of months in the job, so still not really knowing anyone, and he comes right up to me and just gives me this great big hug and with his classic, hello, darling. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, Taz, I'm actually, I am very excited. First time Erica walked in at Branch, she greeted with that biggest smile and it was an instant <laughs> click. She's a lovely human being. She will laugh on nothing. She'll laugh on everything. Uh, and just a, a beautiful soul to work with. I wonder what the night will bring. It won't be long until Taz finds out. As a new cry for help comes into the Emergency Services Telecommunications Authority every 11 seconds. OK, I need you to calm down and listen to my instructions. OK, pump the chest hard and fast. Emergency services. This call is from a daughter worried about her mum. OK, tell me exactly what happened. OK, so I'm with my husband. Mum's at home with my seven-week-old and my two-year-old. Yes. She rang me and she said she's fainting. And it's your mum, is that correct? That's correct. OK, we're going to get some help. C139. Report unconscious patient. Code one, please. NRC139 received. Alrighty, Taz. A 70-year-old female. Our problem is fainting, and that's all the information we have. If it does happen to turn into an arrest, I'll do a primary survey, get the pads on nice and early. Yeah. Um, if you start CPR. I'll see if there's any updates. Oh, here we go. Hang on. Uh, patient called daughter. Yeah. Now there's no answer on callback. Mm, okay. I can't even imagine how terrified daughter will be, thinking why she's not answering. As a paramedic, you can relate that uh, I'm going for the worst case scenario. This patient may be gone into a cardiac arrest or having a stroke. So there's a lot of things happening at the same time in your mind, thinking what I'm headed to. It's a bit 
fresh. I might put the electric blanket on tonight. What do you reckon? I don't know. I just have to... I'll just roll over and give Poppy a cuddle. You She'll would... warm me up. Long-time friends and mobile intensive care paramedics Michaela and Simon are also on night shift. I met Simon when I was preparing to go through my final micro exams. He was a huge help and a mentor for me at that time. The relationship has definitely changed now. We're able to work more alongside each other as equals, which is really nice. For I'm like literally freezing when I'm in bed by myself. I'll be wearing like flannel pajamas and socks tonight. <laughs> Michaela and I get on like a house on fire. Um, we've got a very similar sense of humour. I trust Michaela implicitly, and when it comes to work, we always do the best for the patient. Emergency services. OK, tell me exactly what's happened. My wife has fallen down, and she's looking a lot, and she's not getting up. I don't know what happened. A husband is desperate for help. He's found his wife fallen out of bed, having a seizure. And what caused the fall? I don't know why. Can you ask her? No, she's not talking. She's not talking. Is she breathing? I can see her breathing, but her eyes are not fully open. She's not alert. So there is an ambulance yeah. being sent. Watch her very yeah. closely and look for any changes. OK, I'll do that. Out the way, people. We've been dispatched to a 40-year-old female presented with seizure activity. They've fallen, and prior to collapsing, they've had a headache. Yep. They've got no past history of seizure disorder, epilepsy, so I would be concerned about some sort of intracranial hemorrhage. Yeah. This patient's 40 years old, so that's obviously quite young to be presenting like this. But my first thought is, is she having a stroke, whether it be a clot or a bleed in her brain, causing her to have a seizure? Or there could be something else going on. <laughs> Simon and Michaela get an update from another crew already on scene who just witnessed a further two seizures. The patient has had an MCA a couple of days ago and then she's got a background of headache today. 30 years. We just had an update that the patient has recently had a car accident. This could mean that she could have bleeding on the brain, but we need to keep an open mind because she could have an infection or a brain tumour. Initial car will treat with some midazolam, which they're administering now, and then we'll just see where we end up from there. Yeah. Someone having multiple seizures that don't stop is a serious concern for us, and they are very time critical. The longer that these patients seize, the more damage can be done to their brain, so we want to stop that from happening. On arrival, the other crew explain they've given patient Pratheba a heavy sedative. The seizures have stopped, but she's still unconscious, with husband Nambi watching on. 40-year-old female this evening has been found seizing beside the bed, unknown if head strike fire. Yeah. Witnessed in total to have four tonic tonic seizures, each lasting at least 30 seconds. Yeah. And now at no stage returning to a GCS 15. Yeah. She is federal 38.3. We yeah. just need the jaw thrust here to help with stopping the snore. The patient's unconscious and she's snoring, so her airway is obstructed and she's definitely in a critical condition. If she's having catastrophic bleeding in the brain, she may never wake up. I think for this one, we'll just take all the bags in as well. Yeah. Just in case. On the other side of Melbourne, Taz and Erica are racing to the aid of a 70-year-old grandmother who may have collapsed at home. It's just good to have a plan in place just That's for, great, yeah. for a worst case scenario. All for the best, prepare for the worst. While babysitting her two grandchildren, the woman called her daughter saying she felt faint before the line went dead. It's an update. There's someone on scene now. She's pale, she's not completely alert, she has a history of AF. Uh, Atrial fibrillation is a heartbeat that is often very fast and irregular. And that is our street? On the right. If heart is not pumping properly, this poses a great risk of um, having a blood clot formation in your heart. And this blood clot can travel to your brain and cause a stroke. I'm John. Uh, Something more. OK. And yeah, where are we off to? Uh, just straight to your seat on the couch. Hello there. What's your name? Um... Selma. Hi, Selma. My name's Erica. How are you feeling? Is it just the overwhelming dizziness? Yeah, as if I was trying to be sick. So you're quite nauseated yeah. and sweaty? Mm -hmm. Selma's dizzy and she's pale, so we need to figure out really quickly what's happened, because she looks critically unwell.
Fatiba. Fatiba. Simon and Michaela have some crucial decisions to make to save the life of mother of two, Prathiba. She's had four seizures with no regaining consciousness. Her airway's not patent. Snore and 86% initially. Yep. Prathiba's in immediate life threat. She could have a brain tumour or bleeding on the brain. So it is concerning, OK? The fact that it's happening now for the first time since she's 40, it needs to be investigated. She needs to have a CT scan and all that. It all just happened out of nowhere. Pratiba was supposed to take my son for a tennis lesson. And my son was still sitting on the couch here. And uh, I asked him, what happened? It's six and you're still here. He said, no, mama has not yet come out of the room. So then I went to check, and that's when I noticed that she was down and not responding at all. And my son started yelling, mama, what happened? And then my daughter started uh, shouting, oh, mama is dying. I'll just quickly pop a line in. Yeah, involved in MBA two days ago. So does she have any lumps or bumps on her head? No, that I makes... don't feel any trauma here. Pupils are equal and reactive to light. Yeah. So we'll RSI her. Because this patient's been seizing for so long, she's now unconscious and her body is quite fatigued. She's also not breathing properly and she's not protecting her airway. So we need to now intubate her. It's a tube that allows us to make sure she's getting enough oxygen to survive. I'm happy to go around there, guys, if everyone's ready. With an ambulance branch just around the corner, it's a safe, controlled and private location to perform the risky procedure necessary to give Prathiba the best chance of survival. We've yeah. got everything ready. Fluid loaded, yep. Intubating Prathiba is not a decision that we're making lightly, but without it, she's not protecting her airway, she's not breathing properly, which means that there's a lack of oxygen and nutrients getting to the brain tissue, and over time, this tissue will start to die. It can lead to then long-term deficits in these patients, serious disability, and in some cases, it can cause death. So roles allocated? Yep. So, uh, Michaela, you're going to do the intubation, Josh, you're going to be the airway assistant, I'm going to be administering drugs, Chris is going to keep an eye on the monitor, um, we're going to call out a critical desaturation. If her sats go below 90%, call it out. We'll abort the attempt and reoxygenate. So if you're ready to go? Yep, I am. So 110 milligrams, so 11 mils. We need to sedate Prathiba and then paralyse her. We'll do that using ketamine, which is an anaesthetic agent, which will put her to sleep. 70 milligrams of rocuronium. And then the rocuronium will paralyse all her muscles, which will allow us to place a tube without her gagging. Go for it. That's a minute. We need to perform this swiftly and safely because Prathiba's not breathing and we're not able to breathe for her until the tube is secured. So it's crucial that everybody knows their role and they know the plan because we all have someone's life in our hands. Still feeling sick at the moment? I'm still feeling sick. OK. In Melbourne's northwest, Taz and Erica's patient Selma is not looking well at all. I've got atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, yep. And I had an appointment at the doctor this morning. Yep. And I had a very high heart rate. OK, how high was it, do you know? It was 159. Goodness me, that's a bit quick, isn't it? I took my tablets to stop the heart rate from going mad, but I took it and I nearly fainted. OK, and what time did you take it? Seven. So pretty recently. Yeah. Any troubles with your breathing? Any shortness of breath? No. No? OK. When people feel faint, can be various reasons. So we need to make sure that there's nothing sinister happening in the heart. Stay still, Selma, for a minute. So that ECG where we attach dots on the chest is to get a bigger picture of the heart to rule out if Selma is having things like atrial fibrillation or heart attack. Almost done, Selma. That's it. OK. At the moment, the tracing of your heart looks OK, so there's no signs of atrial fibrillation in the heart attack, which is great. It's just going quite a bit slower than it should be. Sitting in the low 50s, occasionally dipping down into the 40s, and your blood pressure is quite low, which I think explains why we're feeling nauseous, why you got a bit pale and sweaty and, and felt like you were going to pass out. How much of the medication did you take? Just one. Just the one? And how soon after you took the medication did you start feeling unwell? Straight away. Pretty quickly? Yeah. So Selma's gone to the GP today and been found to be in this AF rhythm. The doctors advise her to go home and then to take the medication that she's been prescribed in order to lower her heart rate um, back down to normal. 
So either Selma's taken the medication when she actually wasn't in the AF, seeing as she's left it to the end of the day, or she's perhaps taken too much, or she's been a little bit sensitive to it, which is what's caused her heart rate to fall. If we can put a line in here, I'll give some on Danzatron, yep. and um, I think it's best that we run you up to the hospital tonight. Apart from giving Selma some anti-nausea medication, there is nothing they can do for her at home. She needs to be taken to hospital pronto. So hopefully that just settles your tummy down. <sighs> no worries. This is a serious condition. When your blood pressure and heart rate is low, that means the body is not getting uh, enough blood supply to your vital organs. That can lead to fainting and you can go unresponsive or unconscious. Selma needs to go to hospital. OK. Okie dokie. Watching on, Selma's daughter Charlene is fearing the worst. Seeing mum like this, it's really gut-wrenching. I'm thinking, is her heart rate going to go super low and that she's just going to conk it, basically, um, in front of me? My mum is my best friend. She's my everything. I'm not ready to lose my mum. I'm not ready to let her go. I will be. I'll be okay. Don't worry. I've got a great two of you. It's not great. Yep. Simon and Michaela have set up at an ambulance branch bay to perform a risky RSI procedure that will take over their patient Prothebas breathing. Yep, cool. Would you like to let our for me? But until the tube is in place, the mother of two isn't getting any oxygen at all. As her muscles, including the ones for breathing, have been paralysed so she won't reject the tube going in. ASM markings going through. We've got 23 lips. We're going to incubate the cuff. Sats are still 100%. Pressure. Good, 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 good. Moving version. Good blood pressure. Here you go, Simon. So now waiting for catmography. Good waveform, respiratory waveform. Yes, yeah, I agree. Okay, so team, we're confirming that that tube is in the right place. We've done our supplementary checks. Yep. They're all good. Yep. Oxygenation is good, so we're ventilating at the appropriate rate. So once we've tied that, we're secure with that and we're happy with it, we can yep. load. The intubation's been successful, which is a huge relief. That means that we can get oxygen to Proceba's vital organs and hopefully prevent her from further brain injury. Just nice and slow coming in. But we have to get her to hospital as quick as possible because she's far from out of danger. We still don't know why she's had four seizures and never woke up. If that was caused by bleeding on the brain or a tumour, her life could still be in the balance. She might need urgent surgical intervention, and even that might not be enough to save her. Can you just grab the bag for a bit? I'm just going to fix her hair. Number one, it gets in the way. And number two, I feel like I'd want someone to fix my hair. Yeah. Looking after people is really important to me, and if that was my family member or it was me, I'd want someone to look after me the same way. I think it's all about the little things that we do to ensure we care. Husband Nambi is following the ambulance to hospital. I'm definitely worried that she's not going to survive this. And I have two kids. How are they going to react? She's irreplaceable for all three of us. There we go. Maybe she's got something like a meningioma or something that's growing. Yeah. Like, you never know. Sure. People can go weeks or months or years with a brain tumour and not actually know it's there, and then one day something changes and they start experiencing symptoms, and seizures are one of those things that someone can experience. Pratheba will have a brain scan and they can find out exactly what's going on. All right, you got it for I a got the tube. Yeah, thanks. I definitely have my fingers crossed that these seizures are from an infection, which is still quite serious, but I really hope it's not from a large bleed or a really big brain tumour, and this really causes long-term deficits for her or even that she will pass away from this event. Alrighty, we're just checking your blood pressure again. Mm -hmm. Across town, Selma's medication has caused her heart rate and blood pressure to drop dangerously low. I'll just do another tracing of your heart just to make sure that's all good. Erica and Taz can't reverse the life-threatening effects on scene, so they need to get the much-loved grandma to hospital quickly. I know these things are quite scary, yeah. but we are giving the best care we can. Daughter Charlene and her husband Josh are seriously worried about Selma. 
She's had a lot to cope with over the last few weeks. My mum passed away to me. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm sorry it's been such a rough time for you. It has. Yeah. It's all right. It looks like you've got a really good family support here. Yeah, they're all just here. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All righty, so your blood pressure's come back good. Your heart rate's still going pretty slowly. I'm happy and ready to go, Taz. OK. Mum, I love you. Love you too. Don't be upset. No, I won't. Just okay. when you can message me, message me. It's been really full on in the last couple of weeks. For mum to lose her mum, I couldn't imagine what that feels like because that's my biggest fear. My husband and my children, we live with my mum in mum's home. She's gladly taken us in while we navigate through the world and through motherhood. I am blessed to have a mum like her. All right, let's go. Well, it sounds like you have a very full household. <laughs> sure. Keeps me on my toes. Do you help with the cooking? Pretty mean in the kitchen? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mum used to bake uh, cheesecake. Oh, yeah. And because it's coming up to the burial on Friday, my daughter has been wanting a cheesecake. Do you do a fresh I'm cheesecake good. or a baked cheesecake? Baked. Oh, yum. Once Selma gets better, yes. maybe we should just come to her place for a cheesecake. For cheesecake? <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Not a problem. Lock it in, all right. Lock it in. <laughs> I think laughter is the best medicine. If you can distract the patient's mind uh, away from the suffering, that's a win-win situation because having a little bit of laugh gives the patient that confidence that, yes, I can do this, that we can manage this. Alrighty, Taz, when you're ready. Selma will get a full checkup. The doctor will review her condition and her medication management, and Selma will be given the best advice how to manage this condition. All right, we'll get you in, Selma. Emergency services. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. At the emergency communication centre, another life threatening case is coming through. Oh my goodness, a truck has fallen down on top of my body. Where are you trapped? Oh, in the middle of that engine is on my body. Uh... Okay, we've got help organised. Uh... Okay, you're doing really well. Just be still and wait for help to arrive. I'll stay on the line with you. Yes, please. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, my God. The victim, squashed under a tractor, is by himself on a farm in country Victoria. It's a miracle he's been able to pull out his mobile phone and call for help. All set in the back, Mike. Pleasure, mate. Thank you. While local rescue services race to the scene, MICA flight paramedic Steve and the air ambulance crew are also dispatched from a regional airbase. M3 airborne. Flight paramedics are highly skilled clinicians and perform complex procedures in the most challenging environments. Any time we're dispatched to an incident where there's heavy machinery involved, there's a huge level of concern. We're talking about an extremely heavy weight, probably in excess of two to three tonne that's gone on top of him. So the injuries that he can sustain from this kind of accident can be absolutely catastrophic. Esther Ops Hemmings 3. Just wanted to know whether or not the crews have got heavy rescue coming to uh, get this tractor off this patient. Affirmative, thank you. Patient's cut by his leg. We can't really see what damage is done. He's got extensive, it looks like, evisceration to one of his arms. It's also pinned by the engine of the tractor. Uh, we're getting pain relief on board and I'll get back to you with some numbers soon. Roger. It sounds like this man's trapped by one of his legs and one of his arms has been compressed and now there's multiple fractured bones sticking out. Not only am I worried about his arm and his leg, I still don't even know if he has abdominal injuries, chest injuries and head and neck injuries. This guy is extremely unwell and his injuries are very, very serious. So it's critical that we get to this patient as quick as possible. Is my face clean? You look great. I was actually really worried I had a long hair here. No, I, I would tell it. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quiet start to the day for good mates Steve and Jade. 
The pair have worked together for two years, and Steve thinks he knows his partner pretty well. You pee in the shower, don't you? <laughs> I think everybody does. I don't. Do you what? <laughs> <laughs> the thing I love most about working with Steve is the banter. Nothing is off limits in the truck. But then I don't think much is off limits to anyone that works in health. We find ourselves in situations that are mentally very challenging and humour just helps us to process the things that we're seeing. Absolutely. Well, what about at the beach? I don't go in the water at the beach. Because then you get sand on you when you're wet. You're one of those guys. I love working with Jade. You just want to love her from the second you meet her. There's a warmth about her. There's a charisma about her. We love to have a bit of a laugh at work. But as soon as the job goes off, game face is on. So we're going to a 33-year-old male whose main complaint is laboured breathing and sharp pain in his abdo yeah. with fever. And we are backing my car. He weighs 179 kilos. It also says that he's had gastric sleeve surgery. Yeah, right. So gastric sleeve surgery is when they remove a large portion of your stomach to make the stomach quite small. Move over. Come on. I have seen firsthand how challenging this can be. My own mum has had a gastric bypass surgery. Some people look at this surgery, there's potentially a quick fix, but it's not. It's an evolution of you becoming a new person, and it's hard work. There they are. My immediate concerns for this patient is that they could have an infection, that they might have a sepsis, or a leak after having such a big surgery. Knock, knock. Hey, guys. If your stomach's digestive juices leak out into your abdominal cavity, you can get really, really sick. It's life-threatening, if not managed early. Hello. Hi, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, good. How bad is your pain right now? The pain's there all the time. If I try and get a bigger breath, it's like being stabbed. <sighs> you poor bugger. I just get an ETA. I'd say about 11.40. 11.40, roger. More than 100 kilometres away, the air ambulance team are on their way to help a critically injured man who's been crushed by a tractor. There's two There's the scene. So we've been told by the crews on scene that he has significant injuries to one of his arms and his leg is still trapped. But I'm still extremely concerned about all the other possibilities of injuries that he may have sustained. All clear? All clear. Landing. Landed, yep. He has high potential for pelvic injuries, head, neck, spinal, and major internal injuries. And the longer he's on the ground, the worse the outcome will be for him. Hey, buddy. My name's Steve. I walk towards the scene, and I'm confronted with a horrendous sight. I'm actually shocked that he wasn't just killed outright when the tractors rolled on top of him. The farm worker was trying to pull a tractor out of the bog when the second tractor he was sitting on flipped and landed on top of him. Right, no head strike, no LAC. Uh -huh. Recall of the event. Yep. He's got significant injury to that right arm. Right. And basically the knee to the thigh. Other than that, chest is clear. OK. The natural instinct is to lift a heavy weight off anyone that's trapped in an accident. However, we need to assess this patient and make sure that he's not actually entangled in the wreckage. And I need to be comfortable that this gentleman's going to survive the extrication. So what's he had, mate? He's had 20 of more. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his sats at, mate? Uh, sats for 99. I actually don't feel comfortable with the way he's breathing. Obviously, it would be excruciating the pain that he's in. So the ambulance crews have treated this man with significant pain relief. He's been given ketamine, but it can actually drop your respiratory rate. So he's actually not breathing overly effectively. At the moment, it's just too slow and too shallow. So I'm really worried that he may actually stop breathing and go into cardiac arrest. Can we just grab a mask, just in case he does respiratory arrest? How bad is your pain right now? It's OK when I don't try and breathe deep. OK. And then it's like being stabbed. Paramedics Steve and Jade have arrived to assist a patient experiencing severe pain and fever after weight loss surgery six months ago. Intensive care paramedic Jim has already made his initial assessment. So the story is 50 minutes ago, Matthew's had a sudden onset of upper heavy gastric pain. And you've had gastric surgery. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I that was done several months ago. I was originally right at 200. He's now down around about 180 oh. kilos. Well done, mate. Yeah. There was a complication to go back in the hospital. OK. The complication was a leak from his surgery, and Matthew's partner, Aria, has only just nursed him back to health. Matthew has been dealing with weight issues for a majority of his life. His doctors were very clear about the fact that he would not make it to 40 if he did not make a drastic life change and lose the weight. And that's when he had the surgery. Just doing your blood pressure now. At this stage, I'm really worried, so we need to do a thorough assessment. So I want to check his oxygen saturation and blood pressure. 138 or 85. OK. And I'm also going to do an ECG to make sure that we're eliminating that it could potentially be his heart. There's his ECG. Yeah. Good, very normal. Yep. He's setting in a 97 body out right here. So the numbers are all very good. Yeah. Fortunately, Matthew's not having a cardiac event today, and his vital signs are OK, but he's still got this really high temperature, which is indicating that he's got some kind of infection, and my background worry for that is that the infection's been caused by a leak from his surgery. Ooh. 139, just an update for how far CPAP is away. From scene, we've organised a special ambulance, a complex patient ambulance vehicle, which has greater room within the actual cabin so we can get Matthew to hospital in a comfortable manner. Ooh. I'll start with 25 mics. Yep. Try to make it tolerable for you. See if that takes the edge of it. We need to get Matthew down the stairs, and I'm hoping that the pain relief we've given him will allow him to walk down with a little bit of help from us. All right, if you're able to walk, come in there. Yeah. If you start a bit wobbly, let me know. Can you get some fluid up, mate? Last blood pressure is 130 or 80. OK. A dozen paramedics and heavy rescue crew are surrounding a two-ton tractor that has flipped on top of a farm worker, squashing his right arm and leg. We'll actually get a mask on him. I don't like the way he's breathing. He's too spaced out. My concern is whilst his breathing rate's so slow and shallow, he could go into cardiac arrest. Now, trying to extricate him, ventilate him and manage that cardiac arrest at the same time is almost impossible. So I've requested a mask to provide 100% oxygen to try and assist him with his breathing. All right. Let's get a walk assist belt. We'll put it around his torso. At least we'll have something to grab him on. We'll have the board ready to go so we can drag him straight out. So the next step is extricating the patient. But one of the issues I'm worried about is a thing called crush syndrome. The concern is that where the force is actually compressing the body, in this case for this gentleman, his leg, that there's actually no blood supply beyond the point of the weight. And as a result, the cells start to die. And when that weight's released, the blood supply is returned, and then all the toxins that have been released from the cell death flood the body and actually go on to kill you. Can you just give me a syringe? I'm going to do a VBG on him, mate. Cheers, buddy. So I'm going to do a blood test, and that's going to tell me whether or not he's got early signs of crush syndrome. His K was 3.7, his oh. um, calcium was 1.29. Yep. His pH was 7.2. Thanks, mate. We'll go ahead with the extrication. Yep. Tractor's going to come up, big fella. Yeah, go ahead. So the heavy rescue team are going to use jacks and inflate airbags to lift the tractor. This is a really risky procedure. It's really important that they're extremely careful because any wrong move and this tractor could come crashing down. Good on you, Matthew. Do you want to take a seat here while we wait? Sure. In Melbourne's north, a specialised ambulance for larger patients has been ordered to transport 33-year-old Matthew to hospital. You all right? Yeah. Stephen Jade's 179-kilo patient appears to be suffering a serious complication following gastric sleeve surgery. I'm going to give another 25 of fentanyl. There is no need to be uncomfortable. That's just going to come back at this point. Uh -huh. How do you feel now after losing all the weight? Better. Yeah? It makes life easier, definitely. Yeah. Like, moving, moving is much easier. Yeah, he yeah. walks a lot better. Yeah. She's Listen. had a sleeve as well. Oh, well, you look fabulous. How long ago did you have yours? A couple of months before mine. Yeah. So oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 
Aria has lost 42 kilos since her surgery, and so far, Matthew has lost 60 kilos. Matthew is my best friend. He's um, my partner in crime. So I thought that it would be a good idea if we got the surgery close together in order to go through the journey together because a lot of people see surgery as the easy way out and it really is not. Um, it's extremely challenging. OK, we'll get in the back of the ambulance. Just take it nice and slowly. I'm definitely concerned about his mental health because even though he's making progress with his weight loss, I'm worried he might be thinking, why me? Why is it happening again? I'm worried that he's going to be discouraged. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm OK. Yeah? Ready. All right, we're well, good to go. How long have you and Aria been together? Seven, five years. Yeah, great. So with the surgery, you both were like, we've had enough, we want to make a change. She made the decision for me. Yeah, strong woman. We love a strong woman. Patients absolutely love Jade. Jade's the kind of person that looks you in the eyes and asks you a question and then waits for the response. She doesn't start talking before the response. She's the person that you think, why can't I be more like Jade? You right? Do you want some pain, Millie? Yeah? I think Matthew would definitely have some concerns that this could be a big hurdle for him. But I hope Matthew gets out of hospital and is able to continue with his journey and get back home with his lovely partner, Aria. Fingers crossed. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's all hands on deck to save a man stuck under a two-ton tractor. Stop, Dak. Stop. Mate, can you just dig underneath his foot? Just pull the mud out of the way. We have to be extremely careful lifting this tractor, that we do it very, very slowly, because any false move and the tractor could come crashing down. Yeah, keep going. One, two, three. He's out, he's out. Okay, so we'll just get the pelvic binder on. Oh, he's got a puncture wound there. When I have a look at his legs, I can see puncture wounds, but I can't see any major long bone fractures, and I'm just absolutely amazed that he hasn't actually broken his leg. But his right arm is an absolute mess. The bones are sticking out, there's significant bleeding, and all the internal tissue has been exposed to the elements. It's what we call a limb-threatening injury. Everyone's good? One, two, three. Can you keep pressure on that, mate? We'll need a formidable splint. The risk of infection for this gentleman is astronomically high, so I'm really concerned that he's going to pick up a very nasty infection that not only could result in him losing his arm, but actually could spread across his entire body. Can we give the kef that's being consulted and around? The man's mangled arm was lying in a lot of muck, so a powerful antibiotic is administered to start the fight against infection. BP's 130 on 70, heart rate's 90. All right, let's get in the back of the truck. The priorities now are to get him into the ambulance so we can do an ultrasound on the gentleman's abdomen just to look for any bleeding that may be present around his kidneys or in his pelvic region. Just have a quick squiz here, mate. Uh... I understand, mate, it will be hurting. Do you know what's happened today? You've had a tractor roll on you and it's done a lot of damage. All right, so he's EFAS negative at the moment. Yeah, all good to go. The man's arm is a mess, but miraculously, the ultrasound shows no internal bleeding. Just going into the helicopter now, mate. I'm going to get you to hospital, buddy. I know it's hurting, buddy. I know it's hurting, mate. Can you just quickly set up a fentanyl infusion, mate? Yeah. This man has a really significant injury to his right arm with multiple fractures, open exposure, bleeding, and it would cause excruciating pain for this poor man. A fentanyl infusion would hopefully keep his pain under control. So he's had that tourniquet on an hour, but, mate, there's no radial. I think the right arm's in danger. This patient is the epitome of time critical. He's had a prolonged period of time where the blood supply has been compromised. All set in the back, bud. Uh, take off fresh. And the longer he goes without surgical intervention, the less chance he has of keeping that arm. OK, 
Okay, so Fenton's right. He looks relatively settled. Steve is on his way to Melbourne's Alfred Hospital with his tractor accident patient. It's hoped doctors there can save this man's mangled arm. His heart rate's 76, blood pressure's 120 on 80, and sats are good. These kind of jobs, they're chaotic. We've got a thousand things going on at once. But once we actually get the patient somewhat stable in the back of the helicopter, it gives me time to reflect on just what an impact this injury is going to have on this gentleman's life. Poor fellow, mate, I think he's a right-handed boy too. I reckon out of the whole job that gets to me, it's this. Yeah. Best case scenario is that he keeps his arm, but he just may not have full function. It could affect his ability to work, to write, and on top of that, he could have chronic pain issues. It's a shocking injury. And it's sad to think that his day started out like any other day, and now his life could potentially be changed forever. Oh. Looks like the pain's kicking back in. It's OK, mate. We're just going to give you a little bit more pain relief, OK? You hang in there, you're doing really well. We're at the hospital, OK? Right. We always hope when we drop patients at hospital that there's a positive outcome. But for this man, the fight has just really begun. The road to recovery is going to be astronomically long. I really hope that he's going to be OK, but I'm just not sure. All right, Zachy boy. Oh, good stuff. In his two decades as a paramedic, Steve has learned to be grateful for the blessings he's been given in life. Big kicks to that. Oh, nice. <laughs> I've got a beautiful wife that I've been lucky enough to be with for 23 years now. I've got three beautiful boys, and they're the centre of my life. I'll do anything for them. Yay, Zachy! <laughs> I have seen so many things um, go horribly wrong for people, and it's taught me to seize the opportunity when it comes. <laughs> oh! Like when my kids say, Dad, can we go to the park, or whatever, and you go, oh, God, I'm so tired. But you know what, let's just go and do it. I can sleep later. Because you just don't know what's around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get you out, OK, buddy? It's now been several weeks since Steve's patient was freed from under a two-ton tractor. He's out, he's out. He has undergone several surgeries and has so far managed to keep his arm. But he has a long road ahead. How bad is your pain right now? It's like being stabbed. Seven weeks ago, Matthew had agonising abdominal pain and a fever. As you've had gastric surgery. Yeah. Yep. The culprit was an abscess leaking fluid from his stomach, causing sepsis. The 33-year-old required surgery to insert a stent to drain the fluid back into his stomach where it wouldn't do any harm. Matthew's home now, where his weight loss journey continues. Potiba. She's had four seizures with no regain of consciousness. 40-year-old Pratiba suffered several terrifying seizures at home. So if you're ready to go? Yep, I am. Simon and Michaela had to perform a dangerous but life-saving procedure at a local ambulance branch to stabilise her breathing. It's way down, right? Who wants some popcorn? Me! There, you're ready. After two weeks in hospital, Pratiba is finally back home with husband Nambi and their two kids. Pratiba had a brain tumour. It was benign, but the doctors needed to surgically remove it straight away. When doctors told me I had a tumour, I just, I had tears in my eyes. I just couldn't believe. But I'm really happy that I didn't have to go through any chemo or radiation therapy. And I'm thankful to God that it was non-cancerous. Pratiba will need scans in six months' time, but it's hoped there won't be any long-lasting effects from the tumour. I missed you all so much. We missed you so much too. Yes, I know. You were crying for me daily. Mm -mm. I'm so happy that she's back home. She's a very loving mother, loving wife. She always takes care of us. I cannot imagine a life without Pratibha. If the paramedics hadn't come, I wouldn't have seen my family. So I am extremely grateful. I love you, Mommy. I love you too, baby. Still feeling sick at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
I had the baby in my arm and I nearly fainted. Okay. 70-year-old Selma was babysitting her two young grandkids when her heart rate and blood pressure dropped dangerously low and she collapsed on the couch. I know these things are quite scary, yeah. but we are giving the best care we can. Daughter Charlene was fearing the worst. Do you think it's ready? I think it's ready. It smells really good, Mum. Selma spent the night in hospital where doctors confirmed she'd taken too much of her heart medication. Look what Nanny's got for you. Look. But thankfully, the much-loved grandmother is back home baking the family's favourite cheesecake. Mm. At night, I was frightened, but thank goodness my heart rate did stabilise during the night and they reassured me that I would be all right. Having Mum back at home has been really, really good. I am super grateful to the paramedics. The work that they do, there's no words for it. It's amazing what they do. Without them, Mum might not have been here. I'm really, really thankful. Delish. Thank you.